Good morning and welcome to Ormond Beach Presbyterian Church. We're glad that you've come to join us today for worship. Today is Sunday, June 14th, and we're glad that you are joining us in your home, joining us either on Facebook or through our online uh, worship connection. But we are glad that you draw near. In the coming week, we're gonna be opening doors for worship in the sanctuary at 8 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. And as you're able to come join us for worship on those days, we would love to have you here in person. But if you continue to join us online, please know that we'll continue to be offering this worship experience for those who need to stay home. However it is you arrive at our church to worship with us, we are so glad that you've come to join us. Let us now prepare our hearts for this time of worship together. What a privilege it is for us to lift up our prayers together to God. And so we join together now in this time of prayer. 
scattered in our separate homes and places, but the Holy Spirit joins all of our hearts together as one to lift up our prayers today. So join me now for this time of prayer. We thank you and praise you, Lord God, for your love poured out upon us in Jesus Christ. You have called us by name. You've called us to live for you and to serve you. We thank you that you know us and that you know the gifts that we have. But you also know the fears that sometimes are part of our life and our serving. And yet for all the ways you show up and bless us, we thank you and we praise you. We thank you today, Lord God, for those we love, for those who've been given to us as a precious gift in our family, among our friends, our children, our grandchildren, nieces and nephews, for those whom we pray for every day. Those we ask you to watch over and bless. We ask you to hear our prayers for those we love. We pray today, Lord God, for those who are sad and for those who are hurting, for those perhaps who know, who have lost someone near and dear to their heart. We ask you, Lord God, to be at their side and bless them as they remember and as they also seek to move on in new ways. Hear those, our prayers for those who are sad. We pray today for those who are sick in hospitals and at home, and we pray for those who are caring for them, for doctors, nurses, medical professionals, for caregivers at home. We ask for your healing power for them. And so we pray for those who are sick and recovering from illness. We pray today, Lord God, for our nation, a nation deeply divided. We pray for those whose anger has just kind of boiled over. They can't take it anymore and they need to express their rage at injustice. We pray that all of us would find ways to speak our pain in ways that are creative and that draw us closer to each other and not divided. And so we pray for peace, for reconciliation, and we pray for justice. We pray today for this nation that we love, a nation whose flag flies over our heads and reminds us of the freedoms that are guaranteed to every citizen. Even in these moments, Lord God, we ask thank you for this country and for the freedoms and for those freedoms that our flag guarantees. We pray today, Lord God, for the leaders of our nation we pray for the leaders of our communities. We pray that you would give them wisdom as they seek to guide us in all the decisions that shape our life. And we pray today for this church. As we open the doors for worship in the coming week, we pray that your spirit would welcome all who come and join us, that it would be the spirit of peace and that you would protect each and every person as they enter our doors to feel your presence and to be filled anew with your love and your grace. We offer up all of our prayers. We say thank you for the ways in which you draw near to us and that you love us. All of this we pray thanking you and praising you. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Our New Testament reading for today comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. Let us listen for the word of our Lord. 
Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we still were sinners, Christ died for us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I was looking at my calendar this week, and I had a shocking revelation. It is mid-June. How did that happen? It's already summer. Perhaps it doesn't feel like summer, because many of our usual summer plans are either not taking place or taking place in very different ways. Think for a minute about the summer plans you were making in January and February. My family was looking forward to Montreat Worship and Music Conference in North Carolina. We were going to travel to visit grandparents. And there was music camp and backyard Bible studies. Now, it's all very different from what we had planned. My kids, and to some extent I, have had some challenging moments as we wrestle with the disappointment from seeing those plans canceled. Now in the big picture, canceled summer plans are not of grave importance. Over the past few months, I have read some profound prayers that are circulating around the internet, which emphasize this point. The prayers say things like, we acknowledge that we are disappointed in canceled plans, but more than that, we mourn the loss of life and the loss of jobs. Even as we are sad about trips that won't happen, we hurt even more for those who are struggling with fear and abandonment and people whose basic needs are not being met. These prayers remind us that there are different levels of disappointment. There's the sadness of having summer plans canceled. Then there's the devastating sorrow of lifting up your phone to call a friend because something funny just happened and you know she will laugh out loud when she hears it. And then you realize she's gone. There are different levels of disappointment. Canceled travel plans, missed graduations and proms and weddings, missed funerals, worship services, missed times when we can stand in a circle and hold hands and pray, missed hugs. There is a toll that those disappointments take in our hearts and our lives. As we think about that hurt, we should also consider the sorrows we have suffered as a nation. We have felt despair as we wrestle with the very complex and challenging issues of justice and equality. We watch the video of George Floyd with shock and profound sorrow. 
We see images of people crying out under the strain and the overwhelming weight of hurt and need. Then too, we are confronted with despondency as we grapple with the important questions of how to support the many incredible law enforcement officers who are daily risking their lives to help keep us safe and then pause as they kneel down and acknowledge their own sorrow at our collective struggles with all of these very important issues. It is impossible to name all the disappointments, big and small, that we have suffered as individuals, as communities, and as a nation. But what we do know is that we are left grappling with all of those disappointments. So there's no doubt that our lectionary text for today offers us timely and needed words. In the midst of all the disappointments, large and small, personal and communal, national and worldwide, Paul says to us, hope in Jesus Christ does not disappoint. Yet, there's more to Paul's words than just that phrase. As a master artisan, Paul builds his message in this passage, piece by piece by piece. I've recently had the opportunity to watch as decorative tile is being installed in my bathroom. I cannot tell you how happy I am that it is being installed. Paul's words remind me of that decorative tile. He lays piece after piece. The foundation is Jesus Christ. Christ puts us in right relationship with God. Or as Paul says, we are justified. I think that's one of those phrases that sounds cool, but it can be challenging to understand what it means in our lives. A seminary professor once explained it to me this way. Paul was writing to a people who were desperately trying to find the right passwords that would give them access to God. Some thought obeying the law was the key. Others thought civic virtue was the key. Still others thought that knowledge was the exact right password. But Paul says, we don't need all those different passwords. There's only one password that we need, Christ Jesus. In Christ, we are all put in right relationship with God and we have peace with God. And then Paul lays another tile. Even as we have peace, we are also given the grace in which we stand. I've always loved that phrase. It brings to mind standing firm and straight, not on our own feet, but on the solid rock of our Savior. So as we stand firmly in God's grace, we can boast in our hope of sharing the glory of our God. So those are the tiles that Paul lines up beautifully. Relationship, peace, grace, and finally hope. But then all the artistry flies out the window. Or it seems like it to me. Because this is the point when Paul starts talking about boasting in our suffering. I struggle with that. To be fair, I actually struggle with most of the next two verses. The ones that talk about how and why we are boasting in our suffering. Pastor and teacher Mary Ann McKibben Dana writes that Paul's words here can seem like they are painting a picture of a neat circle where everything fits in place. You see, we boast in hope, we also boast in suffering because suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character and character produces hope. And we are back to the neat circle. But she declares, I'm suspicious of it. 
I am too. She's suspicious of it because it seems too easy. The different parts don't always fit neatly into that circle. And she notes, if that circle represents our best efforts to make sense of a sovereign God and a suffering world, the result is heartbreakingly unsatisfying. Instead of wrestling with the parts to try to make them fit neatly, Dana wonders if it is better to consider how we can live with all the questions. As I grapple with Paul's words, especially for what they mean for us in these times, I think that sounds like a good option to try. We can struggle with what Paul means by boasting in suffering and what that looks like in our own lives. As we wrestle with these concepts, I think we need to acknowledge that it is easier to talk about hope, endurance, and character in the abstract, but talking about suffering is different. Hope, endurance, and character are lovely ideals, amorphous concepts. But when we talk about suffering, it becomes concrete based on our own experiences, whether they are personal or something we have read or seen or heard. So then, we must wrestle with what those concepts of hope, endurance, and character look like in the midst of our lives. What does it look like in your experience? A good friend of mine was in a terrible car wreck. She has undergone surgery after surgery and is now facing relentless rehab. There is a lot to argue with Paul about in her concrete lived experience of suffering. But in the midst of my arguing with Paul, I do see the miracle of her life and how grateful I am for her. I also see in her a profound picture of endurance, character, and hope. Perhaps there are moments when we can boast in the endurance, character, and hope that Christ reveals to us in the midst of suffering. Yet I also believe that there are times when endurance, character, and hope are nowhere to be found. That's when we really wrestle with Paul and his words. I would like to think that in such situations, that's when we come back to Christ, who, as Paul reminds us, suffered and died for us while we were still weak. When we run out of neatly fitting parts, we come back to God's love for us, a love that was so great, Christ died for us while we were still sinners. That, that is the grace in which we stand. That's the hope that does not disappoint. Just like there's different kinds of disappointments, there are different kinds of hope. Some days, I hope it doesn't rain. Many days, I hope my Georgia Bulldogs have a really good season this year. But those hopes are not the same kind of hope that is given to us in Christ. That is a hope that does not falter. It does not falter because it's not based upon who we are or anything we must do. It is a hope based on who Christ is and what he does. This is not to say there will not be suffering. It is not to say that the suffering will make sense and can be neatly wrapped up in a bow. It is to say that Christ stands in the midst of our suffering and we stand firmly in him. The anthem that our adults and children are singing for today's worship service puts words to this very concept. It names the suffering. The words say we are longing for light and we wait in darkness. 
longing for peace, our world is troubled, longing for hope, many despair, longing for food, many are hungry, longing for water, many still thirst, longing for shelter, many are homeless, longing for hearts that yearn to belong. But the psalm also names the source of our endurance, character, and hope. The words proclaim, today we are longing for truth, so we turn to you. Your word alone has power to save us. Make us your living voice. The chorus proclaims, Christ be our light. Shine in our hearts, shine through the darkness. Christ be our light. Shine in your church gathered today. It is a very hopeful song for a time when we need hope. We have gone through many disappointments, big and small, and we should not gloss over them. When I was growing up, disappointment held a great deal of power and influence. What's the worst thing my mom could ever say to me? It was worse than a spanking. It was worse than anger. It was worse than wait until your father gets home. What was possibly worse? These words, I'm very disappointed in you. Disappointment brings to bear hurt, confusion, and questions. That, my friends, is why Paul's words are so very important, especially so important for us in these times. The hope in Jesus Christ does not disappoint. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Church, I thank you for the gifts that you send to the church, your pledges and your tithes that are arrive in the mail or that come to us by our online giving app at ormanbeachpc.org. We're grateful for each and every gift for what you are doing is keeping the doors of this church open and soon to open for in-person worship to allow us to be able to continue to do the work that we have in this community. So I thank you and I give thanks on behalf of the entire congregation for your love for Christ in this church. I once heard a sermon on today's text and the pastor mentioned a painting that he had seen that spoke profoundly to him of Paul's words. It was a painting from the 1800s by a man named G.F. Watts. I was intrigued so I looked it up. Here's an image of it. I think the painting is actually called Hope. Now I looked at that painting and my first thought was, how could this be called Hope? That woman looks as if she is in utter despair. But then, then I looked more closely and I saw that there was one harp string. One harp string that that woman can play. Friends, Christ is our harp string. He is the light that shines, that gives us hope. That hope does not disappoint. So, go out this day and however you are able with the talents God has given you, play that one heart string. Proclaim Christ who is our light and our hope. And as you go, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.